We're joined by Senator Nina Turner. She is a former Ohio State Senator, the former national co-chair on the Bernie Sanders 2020 campaign, and she is now running for Congress in Ohio's 11th district. Uh, Senator Turner, uh, welcome back to Jacobin. Thank you, Micah. So good to be here with you. Tell us about your campaign that you have uh, just recently launched. What's different about the campaign this time around? You obviously ran for this uh, seat recently uh, uh, in a special election uh, and lost that campaign. So what's what's going on this time that uh, is, is different? Well, you know, the concerns and the needs, the challenges and the opportunities are still the same. And that is why I am running this race again. As you stated, it was a special election in 2021. So 2022, this is the natural life cycle, if you will, uh, for this uh, seat, uh, not just this seat, but 435 members of Congress are are up for either election or uh, re-election in, in some cases. But I'm running because of the needs uh, are great in my district and in, in greater Cleveland. The needs are great. Cleveland is the largest poor city of its size. People are suffering. And, you know, from my vantage point, Micah, and, and, I, and I believe I'm not the only one that feels this way, there is a difference between voting the right way you know, checking off the box and fighting for something, standing up for something, giving it all you got, being out there on the front lines uh, with the people, whether it's standing with the members of House of Labor, who definitely exploded last year in 2021. And we see that rippling into 2022. And I think it is a beautiful thing to see labor stand up and say, we deserve more. And Micah, I wanna see that same spirit just flow out for all working people, all working people deserve more. They deserve more. And so that's why I'm running again. So when you ask me what has changed, uh, the, the fierce urgency of now, to quote the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., it was, it was urgent in 2021, in 2020, in 2019, and it's urgent right now in 2022 that people deserve to live a good life. And there's some components to that. It's having health care. Yeah, it is having clean air, clean water, clean food, just minimally, Mike. We're just talking about the bare minimum things that people not only in the United States deserve, people not only in the great greater Cleveland district deserve, but people all over the world deserve. So I am running because I am a fighter and a champion of the people. And I firmly believe that this district, this nation and this world needs more champions. So I want to get back to some of the specifics of your district in a second. But first, can we talk a little bit about what's going on in national politics right now. I mean, you've spoken very freely in the media and elsewhere about your criticisms of uh, the Joe Biden administration at, at year one, uh, criticisms of the Democratic Party leadership generally. What's your assessment uh, one year into the Biden administration about uh, what has gone right and what's gone wrong with that administration? Well, certainly the administration's and the Congress's response, you know, the, the CARE Act, I mean, that was something that was necessary to try to, to to lift the people who are suffering the most in this country, which is far too many people. That, that was a great start. There is a however to this. In the midst of a pandemic, we should be doing a whole lot more. I believe that the president should just use executive orders as much as he can, worry about the courts and who's going to sue him and the administration over doing the right thing for the people and canceling student debt comes first to mind but i believe the president also could use his executive order pen to move marijuana from from uh, off of schedule one uh so in, in the criminal justice aspect of that doing that and and helping people who have been uh, lives have been devastated because of marijuana and we know uh, that in many states in this country and it's going to continue to grow the legalization of marijuana not just for municipal use but also for recreational use so what are the things that the president in this moment can use the power of the pen the power of executive order to do also not allowing things like the child tax credit to expire i mean mike as we talk right now it has expired it was one of the best things that the administration and the congress did which was to have a child tax credits 
cut childhood poverty in half. Now we can debate whether 50%, yeah, it's good, but let's just go ahead and make it 100%. Because if you cut it by half, that means that we still got a whole nother half of children who are still living in poverty. But I'm gonna put that in the parking lot. The fact that we understand that poverty is a policy choice, that is one example of it. So why not make that permanent and let us go to 100%. I also believe that the president should gas up the jet. You know, he was very diplomatic with two senators in particular, Manchin and Cinema. I don't fault him for that. Maybe that is the way to go at first. But in the words of the immortal um, Dr. Maya Angelou, when people show you who you are, who they are, you got to believe them. So I want to see the president of the United States really push for, stand up for what he ran on in 2020. You know, canceling student debt to at least $10,000. Now, those of us on the progressive side, we want it all the way, but at least let's start with that $10,000 going, going ham for voting rights in this country, because that is the fundamental basis by which people get elected. And so if we want to have more Democrats elected, we have to make sure that we are expanding and protecting access to the ballot box for everybody, not just people who vote Democrat. Michael, I'm just talking about the basics. So just using the bully pulpit more and painting the vision and also standing up for that vision. And that does, does not just apply to the president of the United States of America. That applies to the Democratic Party, my party that has the power. So you can't act like you're helpless when the people with the highest titles in the United States of America control the House of Representatives, the United States Senate and the presidency. So we should act like it and go go ham on behalf of the poor, the working poor, and the barely middle class. I think a lot of people in the early months of the Biden administration were pretty surprised, particularly people like us, progressives and socialists and other folks on the left were surprised, who had been critics of Joe Biden, were surprised to see him come out of the gate pretty strong on a number of uh, questions, and even surprised at some of the aspects of the a build Back Better bill. I uh, traveled to uh, Iowa at one point to hear uh, Senator Bernie Sanders on the stump, sort of selling some of the very progressive aspects uh, of, of the infrastructure bill. And then, of course, as time went on, it was uh, whittled down and whittled down. And uh, I think a lot of people were a little disappointed in uh, how the president handled questions like uh, Senators Manchin and Cinema. Uh, so what, what's your assessment of, of, of the Build Back Better uh, process specifically what what should have been done uh, so far what could be done going forward Mike is really the least that we can do really uh, we went from progressives wanting you know about what 10 billion or so uh, dollars to almost nothing now we still can't even get that nothing passed this build back better less again another example of how the president, and this Congress need to do more, especially in the face of this pandemic. I wanna see it be more robust. Now, that being said, uh, Senators Manchin and Cinema have shown time and time again who they really are, that they really don't care about changing the material conditions of the people who need it the most. We're at a point now where the bill has to be broken up. I don't agree with that, but let's go ahead and call the roll. We are where we are right now, so let's put paid family leave on the table and see who's going to vote it up and who's going to vote it down. And that goes for Republicans too, Micah, because we shouldn't let them off the hook. To quote my maternal grandmother, they have lost their ever-loving minds. Uh, we have a two-party system in the United States, two-major party system in the United States of America. One of those parties ought to stand up for the people. And given the state of the Republican Party in the 21st century, it needs to be the Democrats. It needs to be my party. So now that we got to break it up, let's put all that stuff on the floor, put it on the line and, and see who's voting, who, which side people are standing on. And I think that the president should take that out to the people to say, these are the folks standing in the way of an agenda that will help you and your family and your community. And we cannot stand for it. He should say there will be a consequence, meaning a hey, primary in the same way that Senator Bernard Sanders is saying now, some of us have been saying that for a while, you have got to let these people know for certain things, there has to be a consequence. And standing in the way of expanding and protecting voting rights so that you can keep a Senate rule intact, a rule that has been used to, to bump up against civil rights and racial justice in this country, there is something wrong with it. And that doesn't mean, Michael, that people can't have their individual beliefs. You know, Congress does not work for the president. I understand that, but they are elected. 
to meet the needs of their people, period. So there are just some things that we got to have some agreement on. And I would say that voting rights is one of those things that we all should have agreement on and including the Republicans. But we know what they're doing in legislatures all across the country. So we don't have any agreement with most Republicans right now. And we got to deal with that. So having bipartisanship just for the sake of bipartisanship doesn't make sense to me. When you make an offer when it comes to voting rights and the other side doesn't want to play ball, then, hey, we got to say we go into battle over this. And within our own party, too, Michael, we got to be able to critique our own party. We can't get we got 50 votes and we have a vice president that can break a tie. So we as Democrats got to deal with the people in our own house first before we start talking about the Republicans or we can do both at the same time because the Republicans are absolutely wrong and they are devastating democracy all over this country, which is another reason why we need the federal government to stand up and protect voting rights. You've been talking a little bit about what the big picture strategy uh, on these questions should be. I wonder, with a little thought experiment, let's say uh, Representative Nina Turner gets elected at the same time uh, as, as Joe Biden and takes office at the same time and is in uh, Congress at the same time as uh, Joe Biden as the president over the past year. What would uh, you specifically as a member of Congress have done over the last year. You said gas up the jet, that Joe Biden should gas up the jet. I assume you mean that he should be going to West Virginia uh, to put the pressure on, on, on Joe Manchin. Would uh, would Nina Turner be uh, gassing up the jet? Uh, what, what, what would Nina Turner's, uh, uh, Representative Nina Turner's strategy have looked like over the past year for you in particular? Yeah, oh no, I would be gassing up the jet, gassing up the cars, absolutely. Cause you, at some point you gotta take it to the people. And just even in thinking about President FDR, and what he was able to do, certainly not perfect. His poli- the policies that were pushed uh, through with his administration through Congress at the time, we know that it left a lot to be to be wanting, uh, especially when it came to race. You know, African American community in particular, but the found the fundamentals of it was really solid. And what President FDR came to realize is that in the midst of a crushing depression that what he carried, like the the people's power that, that he carried was not just about pushing public policy through, but also getting intimate with the American people. And so that fireside chat model is not old fashioned. It never goes out of style to again, take it to the people and get them motivated and energized, give them something that they can feel and follow through on it too. So it just can't be about the words. It has to be to the American people. I need you. And let me tell you why, why I need you. This is what I'm trying to do. And we got two Democrats and the Republican party, but let's just, let me deal with the people in my party first who just outright said that they are not going to help me be able to push this agenda. And so there has to be a consequence for this. And so that he rallies the American people in a very intimate way to his side for the vision that he has for this country. You have got to be able to to do that. And so for me, uh, I specialize in that, you know, being an activist, a kind of leader, you know, I'm that. I've stood side by side with the House of Labor. I went to Bessemer, Alabama, Micah. I've been with the members of the House of Labor, even, you know, even as a state senator, as a council person. So this ain't new to me. At some point when the die is cast, you got to take it to the streets. And that really is also what my campaign is about, is taking it to the streets streets and and helping to give people something that they can feel and a leader is certainly not expected to do all of that by themselves the people entrust us with their power and so once people who who have been elected or or who are elected right now understand that this ain't about them this is about the people have entrusted you for a limited amount of time with their power and when their power is being misused you got to go back to them and say i need your help for these reasons i want to make sure that everybody in this country has unfettered access to the ballot box but i got two people standing in the way of it if it is too micah because i believe some other folks hiding behind mansion and cinema but i digress help me do you believe that uh voting rights should be unfettered yes okay well i need you to put some pressure on them and then have a consequence for it oh yeah cinema mansion we coming for you because obviously you are republicans now what you just said to me sounds like politics of it aside and progressive content of it aside just sounds like a basic commitment to doing small d democratic politics. And yet this seems so foreign to so many in the Democratic Party. This is not 
how they are accustomed to doing politics uh, in the 21st century. Do, do you agree with that? And if so, why is it? Why is it so weird to hear uh, somebody who is running for office say that I want to take it to the people that I want to uh, be on the ground with people and explaining the policies uh, that we're pushing for to them? That seems like that should be just like the 101 of uh, policymaking and, and politics. No, I, I agree with you, Michael, wholeheartedly. I think part of the problem that the kind of zeitgeist and the of people in the political bubble, a lot of these elected officials really do think it's all about them. And many of them are disconnected from the real pain of everyday people. You know, two things can be true at once. While yes, the bipartisan infrastructure bill by way of example was passed, true. Were there some good elements of it? Absolutely, especially on the uh, public transit side. There's a however to that. Big mama not going to feel that anytime soon. And when you really distill it down, the people who benefit from those kinds of big policies are cor the corporatists. They're going to feel it first. What is having a paved road when your house is in foreclosure? What is having a paved road when you can't put food on the table? What is having a paved road when you can't take time off when you're sick, especially in the midst of a pandemic, because the federal government won't push these corporations to do right by their people and hell won't even pass a public policy to say that you can have paid family and medical leave. So it, we, it's not an either or we need. And so Mike, I just believe that some of these folks, not all, but far too many of them are getting high off their own supply. They think they're more important than the whole. And some of these folks just outright don't give a damn. That, that's the truth of it. Because in the midst of a pandemic, how can you be so heartless and not see that we need universal health care? Another example, Micah, that we cannot continue to commodify health care. How can you continue to let the pharmaceutical industry dictate prices of prescription drugs in this country where uh, back at the ranch in other countries, other industrialized nations, that is not the way that it is. How can you be have such indifference michael that's what can, how can you have such callous indifference to people suffering so that that's what, the corporatist agenda of both political parties is out of step with the real needs of the american people be they poor working poor or barely middle class because everybody comes at this from a different experience but if you are not part of the one percent or even the five percent Maybe we throw the 10%. If you are not in the upper echelons, if you are not one of those 660 billionaires in this country, one thing can throw off, even if you are at the top of the working class, Mike, because I believe we all working class. It's just some people are at the bottom, some people are at the middle, and some people are at the top. But if you don't have a trust fund, if you ain't got a sugar daddy, a sugar mama, a sugar somebody that can bail you out, if a catastrophic health uh, incident happens to you or somebody you love, even if you are blessed to be at the upper side of the middle class, it can wipe you out. So why are we putting people in these kinds of situations when we can have public policy that gives everybody a true opportunity to have a good life? It doesn't make sense to me, Micah. Some of these people, and we got to be honest about it, they don't give a damn. Now, when you talk like that about uh, both parties, the kind of pro-corporate nature of both parties. Anybody who's ever listened to you in, in the media or on the campaign trail has heard that critique of both parties. Uh, I think you usually describe it as we get to fight both the neo-fascists and the neo-liberals uh, that are out there. Um, and you know that includes fighting within the, your own party, the, the Democratic Party. You're running as a Democrat. Um, and when you do that, as we've learned, I think, over the last five or six years since the first Bernie Sanders campaign, uh, the party doesn't just uh, sit there and take it from you. The party, uh, the, the pro-corporate wing of the party uh, fights back uh, very hard. You seem to experience that in uh, when you ran last year. Uh, of course, we can list off a million uh, examples, uh, folks like India Walton and her run for uh, mayor of Buffalo. I mean, the party establishment mobilized alongside uh, the right to try to take her out, despite the fact that she had won the primary. Uh, so how, how do you think of the, how do you go about that sort of both and you're like, yes, I'm in, in the Democratic Party, but I also recognize that there is leadership, this party that does not like me, does not like people like me, does not want to advance this kind of pro working class uh, agenda that we so desperately need right now. Yeah, because they're trying to snuff out 
So people like me or India or even Senator Sanders, you know, even if, when I reflect on 2020, just the very thought that he was going to run again. You know, there were articles out there about people are going to Martha's Vineyard to plot against him even before he even announced. Right. He's the conduit. I'm the conduit. India was the conduit and other leaders like us. But you know what their ultimate goal is, is to snatch the hope from the movement itself because they know that a conscious minded people on the move cannot be deterred cannot be stopped that is their ultimate goal now they have to target people like me and people like india walton and people like senator sanders or people like you know congresswoman cory bush you name it they have to target certain people to be able to do this so that they can uh take away like try to snatch hope away from the movement itself I am in this and I believe that many people who believe the same way that I am is is for the larger for the larger goal here, which is, you know, let me go back. Cleveland was a uh, 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 Cleveland was a, de uh, a destination on the Underground Railroad. It was a stop on the Underground Railroad and our name was Hope. Hope, because we were the last place coming through here before the enslaved who were trying to escape could get to Canada. Hope. So hope is an absolute motivator for humankind. We thrive on it because it is that, that belief that no matter how hard times are, that we can we, we can get through if we put some sweat equity on it. That is really what these corporatists are after. And so for me, whether I get another extra special title or not, I am here for the long haul to continue to inspire hope. Hope is an action word, and that's what they fear the most. Uh, Micah, I really do believe that these corporatists would do something to their own mama to try to stop the progressives. And we have seen example after example after example of that, that what I am saying is not hyperbole. It has been proven time and time again. And so that is why publications like Jacobin is so important. Independent media is important because we all have a role to play in being on this justice journey. And it is a journey that each generation has to take up in its own time, building on what people who came before us did building and fighting in our lifetime and setting the next play for the next uh, generation of freedom fighters to come and we will keep this going so as long as there is evil in the world good must continue to to push back i often say uh, evil, good can never take a vacation evil never sleeps so good can never take a vacation so we are in an epic battle for humanity and that is what these races represent on a, on a, on a micro level. But when you put it all together, it really is about the kind of nation and world by extension that we are trying to create so that people who are poor, people who are among the working poor and people who are among the barely, barely middle class. Again, it goes back to, do we believe that people deserve? And I use that word deserve to live a good life and then what are the fundamental principles of living a good life what is the social contract that we're going to have one to another just at the base level and then people can build on that foundation but micah in order to build on the found you got to have a strong foundation to build on and that's what those of us who are on the progressive left or the freedom fighting left that's really what we are fighting for and talking about and really pushing for, for is just giving people a strong foundation by which they can build. Now you started getting in that answer a little bit about uh, what my next question was, which is the sense that I've gotten from a lot of people that's kind of taken a, a, a good year, year and a half or so, uh, or, or even two years to really realize that a lot of people are feeling really demoralized right now. I mean, particularly uh, of course, after the, the 2020 Sanders campaign, but just in general, uh, things just seem to get worse by the day around here. Uh, and it's very difficult to keep that kind of spirit alive that you uh, were just uh, talking about as being essential for us to be able to uh, transform the world to be a decent and dignified place. So, um, you know, you're somebody who is uh, just launching this campaign and is going to really count on people uh, not being demoralized, but actually being excited about what, what it is that you're up to. So what's your pep talk to them to sort of yeah. pick them up uh, in, when they're feeling a little, pretty down about the state of the world right now? 
that the power rests with all of us that if we're willing to put a little extra on our ordinary extraordinary things can and do happen and we're gonna lose some we're gonna win some and i'm not just talking about races even in life like even in our individual life sometimes things go according to plan and sometimes they don't but you know there's a saying that if you can look up you can get up and that is my message to our movement baby if we can look up we can get up and to understand that destination hope is the way to go and that this movement pouring into candidates like me or movements you know like our entire movement whether it's on the labor side the the political side there are many aspects to our movement that we must keep pushing because we really don't have any choice all that we love is on the line so either we're going to sit it out and allow the corporatists of this country the people who are obsessed with greed win or we will continue to fight that's it. You know, it really is as simple as that. And to embrace the fact that sometimes we're going to lose and sometimes we're going to win, but we must keep pushing. You know, there's a, a quote, I'm a quote machine, Micah, and I'm sure people who know me know this and people who are getting to know me, my love language is quotes. But just even thinking about, you know, one of my sheroes, Harriet Tubman, you know, the Moses of her people, she said, you know, if, if, if you, she has this thing about keep going, you know, if you hear the dogs, keep going, you know, if there are torches behind you, keep going. You know, if you want to taste of freedom, never stop. Keep going. And so that is my message. She was talking about that in the context of African people and then their 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 descendants, African Americans being enslaved. And she's saying your very physical freedom, baby, if you want it, you must keep going, even if they come in after you with the torches, even if they come in after you with the barking dogs, baby, you must keep going. So that is my message. And that is why I want this movement to keep going. I need this movement, Micah, to invest in me again, just as they did last year. I need them to do it again, to invest, to keep going. No amount is too small. Certainly no amount is too large within the, you know, the the, the legal ramifications, what, what, what is the max out, but just keep going every $5, every $10, every $27 invested into this campaign and help us build, continue to build a movement that is built to last, that is generationally strong. That is what we need. So even in our saddest moments, we must keep going because our mission is so high, we can't get over it. Our mission is so low, we can't get under it. And our mission is so wide, we cannot get around it. We can't give up. We got to keep going. And then one more quote, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I might not have this exactly right, but he said that there's some, you know, we can have finite disappointment, but we must never lose infinite hope. That's it. And we can't let anybody, anybody make us feel like what we are fighting for is wrong. People might not agree uh, with our us being on the progressive left or what I call the freedom fighting left, but who, what reasonable person can argue with the fact that wanting universal health care is right? Wanting people to have paid family medical leave is right. Wanting uh, to have the president cancel student debt is right. Wanting people to have a living wage is right. And Micah, you know what? If those things are wrong, I don't want to be right. If standing up for that, People to be able to unionize so they sit across the table from uh, the, the the managers and the people who make the decisions in the company and be able to collectively bargain for better wages and better work conditions and better benefits. If that's wrong, I don't want to be right. And we're just going to leave this video in the tabs of my computer. Anytime I'm feeling down, I'm just going to have it queued up right to that segment. And I'll, you know, pick me, pick me right up there. So as we uh, wrap up here, I just wanted to ask uh, specifically a lot of people who uh, know you uh, on the national level and probably know you through Jacobin are, are familiar with your, your work on the national level, but you are running uh, in Cleveland in Ohio's 11th district. Can you tell us a little bit about what the agenda, spe agenda specifically for your district uh would look like with you in office what is uh what, you know what is your uh what are your constituency feeling right now what what is it what do they need there uh, in cleveland yeah. we need i mean need jobs uh cleveland is the largest poor it's the largest poor city uh in the nation so we we need jobs people need resources that is economic economic justice in all of its forms and it, this is both a class and a caste component because mike i often talk about race and class together that we're going to fight uh, black and white hispanic 
Asian, you know, everybody else in between, all of us, no matter how people identify together, we rise and fall together. And that is what the labor movement is showing us. Make no mistake, there were Trumpites, you know, there were Bernie Kratz, Clintonites, Bidenites, whatever people calling themselves these days, Turnerites, whatever, side by side in the labor movement. But if we look at John Deere, for example, or any Kellogg's, all of the people who were standing up last year to say, say to the man and to the woman, who have the power in these corporations that we deserve better and we are going to strike for better. We're going to stand up for better. We're going to demand better. Those people put aside their political ideologies to unite based on what they have in common. And that is what I am standing up for. That is what my district needs. You know, we have uh, lead concerns in, in the greater Cleveland area job concerns, just total quality of life concerns. And so my campaign is about what it was about uh, last time I ran. It is about changing the material conditions of the people who are suffering the most. And I believe if we take care of the people who are suffering mo the most, everybody else is going to be all right. That is what it is about. That is what the needs are of my community. And that is what I'm going to continue to fight for. So people can go to ninaturner.com. Please help and join this fight that we are in right now uh, for justice in all of its forms. ninaturner.com. You can volunteer time, talent, and treasure. That is what we need. State Senator Nina Turner, uh, who just recently announced her run for Congress in Ohio's 11th district. We really appreciate you taking the time to talk with Jacobin today. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I adore Jacobin so much. I am so glad that you all are there. If you like this video from The Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks.